welcome at Pakhuis de Zwijger, um, uh, also on behalf of the Thrive Institute. And tonight we organize a hybrid event. We have over 200 people here in Pakhuis de Zwijger. Maybe can I can hear you with an applause? <laughs> <laughs> but we also are very happy, of course, with all the people watching at home uh, through our live cast. Welcome uh, to all of you also. My, nam, my name is Natasha van der Berg and I will be the host for tonight. And we celebrate tonight <coughs> the launch of Thrive Fundamentals for a New economy and um, which according to the foreword of the book offers according to Jeremy Land who wrote the foreword offers an accelerating vision for the pathway <laughs> to a post-capitalist vibrant ecological civilization so there's something to discuss tonight and of course um, I'm going to interview some of the contributors to the book uh, but we of course start with the editors who made this book possible. Give them an amazing applause. Kees Klomp and Sinta Oosterwaal. Welcome. <laughs> that is for you. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, a new economic book. There are many books about economics today. Um, but, um, it's necessary, according to you, to create or present new perspectives mm -hmm. um, to economy, to our economy. Why is that necessary? Ladies first. Sinta, <laughs> why is it necessary? Do we why was this book necessary? I think that a lot of the economics debate is about economic reform only, within the same narrative as um, you know, the conditions of the capitalistic society form the same narrative. Mm. And we wanted to offer a perspective into a new world. So that's what you'll find in, in this book. Uh, to a new world. How, can you describe that new world? Um, yes. Uh, <laughs> I, I, th I think the main drive of the people that we have um, asked to contribute to our book is that they're well-being focused rather than only welfare focused and I yeah. think it, it sounds like uh, a simple exchange of words but I think it's quite fundamental if you focus on well-being which is uh, a, a, a general sense of well-being so not only about the financial side of things but also the natural ecological and social and individual side of things the whole economics debate gets broadened in a quite fundamental way. And, and in our opinion, that broadening is lacking in much of the conventional economics debate. Yeah. Uh, you are, you are v famous in the Netherlands for quoting, we need a new economy uh, and we should create that without economists. Yes. <laughs> Yes, Let's have an economic how. debate yes. without yes. economists. And, and, and soon Hans is going to uh, slay me here on, uh, on stage yeah, for saying it. I'm going to interview him in a few minutes, so don't worry. Uh, yeah. No, no, no but, well, I've, I, I think at this, mo at this time in an uh, in, um, in era, uh, we drastically have to look beyond economics to find solutions for economics. Exactly. Yeah. So let's have a, a conversation about the future of our economy and let's go much further and broader the perspectives than only the economic perspectives on life. Is the world ready for these new perspectives? What do you think? Well, we didn't write it for nothing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we, we decided that the world is ready to hear this, yeah. these voices, I think. Yeah. 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 We wanted the transformation to happen instead of just cosmetic tweaking. Mm -hmm. um, so um, we're offering new perspectives to generate a pull towards what is new and what is possible as well. What is happening also. It's already happening. Yeah. But it gives a, a lens on all those activities in the world which already are living the alternative. They or didn't actually get the doing. stage yeah. up till now, we hope. Mm -hmm. we, we try to give these, these, these new stories a stage. Yeah. And if I would say, what's the fundamental 
um, message of this book about fundamentals? Ecology, ecology, ecology. <laughs> For a book on economics, that sounds strange. Yes. Well... It's strange that it hasn't been yeah. about ecology before, <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah. So explain. Yeah. No, so... so um, well, I, I think what we're learning uh, at this time uh, and era in, in quite a harsh way is that we, that we have lacked to integrate ecology uh, as a fundamental in economy. Uh, and don't get me wrong, there are lots of brilliant economists out there that also have integrated ecology. Uh, but uh, uh, I think it's time to put ecology first yeah. uh, and, uh, and quite dramatically first. And that is also the reason why we have invited a lot of uh, non-economists in our book, that I think that the, the, the science of, of economics uh, needs broad and fresh perspectives on the science itself. And, uh, and I don't think we can expect it from, inward, uh, from the science inward. I think we need to have fresh outside perspectives. Mm. What we also really longed for was to put life at the center yeah. of economic thinking. And that's something that's really lacking, I think. And when you, when you uh, primarily focus on ecology and you put economics in service of ecology, then you get a very, very different framework. Yeah, so for those neoclassical economists who now are watching this live stream or in the, in the rooms, I hello. <laughs> Oh my God! I'm a secret neoclassical economist. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, um, who, who are who are well curious if, because you are saying I mean you should know this you should be thinking putting life in the center of your thinking. Uh, what would happen if you put life or ecology in the center or mm. of economic thinking? Well, you would be more adept to 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 actual problems that occur now, right? You know when when economics became economics as we, well, most of us know it, that it was a very different time. Mm -hmm. And I think the challenges of today in the world ask for different uh, approaches. And that's why you say it's not only the economics approach that you need, you need uh, multidisciplinary ap yeah. approaches. Um, but also to put pri of life uh, primarily in, a f in the forefront, um, that enables us to make radical different decisions and I think that's very important. Yeah, so, so let's, let's recap the neoliberal, the neoclassical thinking. Um, man is a rational being. Mm -hmm. We all seek to maximize our own profits. Uh, that's the idea. Yeah. Um, that's the fundamental idea of neoclassical thinking. Um, what happens, what are the fundamental ideas if you would put life or ecology at the fundamentals, uh, as a fundamentals uh, thinking in economy? What would then be the law? Well, I think the, 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 the main shift that takes place is that you change the transactional mode for relational mode. And so everything is inter <coughs> interconnected, interrelated to each other. And, and that means that um, although economics has, has created all sorts of economic roles, eh, like uh, you are a consumer or a producer or a household or the market, but they're all ecology-driven entities. Eh, so uh, what we think is mostly important if you, if you take life as a center is that everything becomes connected. So you can't isolate economic perspectives or decisions. It's just impossible. It's delusional. It, it's not possible anymore. No, it isn't. No. no. It, well, I, 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 I don't think it, it's ha it has ever been possible, but mm. we did as if. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and now we're not able to, uh, to delude ourselves anymore. Well, you, you just described the image of man, and it's fragmented. You mm. know, when you describe it, it's, it's not who man really is, no. or woman. So, so that's what you need to seek out again, right? The wholeness in humankind. Um, but in a capitalistic society, um, the system reinforces this fragmented image of man, which produces an unhealthy society. So that's why Jeremy Land, we were so happy that he would write the, for the foreword, and he wrote about ecological c uh, civilization. Um, so what we seek is to find that wholeness again. I think that when you approach it from the life perspective, then you're forced to, to, to approach it from a wholeness perspective. Yeah. And then you go to your classrooms and you, start, mm. you go to lecture this new vision on economics. 
yeah. um, to, to, to students yes. um, who, <laughs> from the most part, probably get different perspectives. Well, that, that was, that was the, the, the main driver for, for Sin and, and I to write this book, is that we basically, when we started out, we wanted to make a reader. Yeah. For a, our syllabus. a syllabus for our yeah. students because they all get educated on our universities and universities of applied science and they have this uh, subject called economics yeah. and uh, a lot a lo lots of them don't understand that they are actually are taught neoclassical economics yeah. rather than economics and uh, and and if you have a very enlightened teacher or lecturer that uh, for instance knows uh, Kate Rayworth because most of the people know Kate now uh, but she's only one of the many, many f f new interesting perspectives on economics. And we basically started, when we started, we wanted to offer our students at least the opportunity to discover the pluralistic uh, s uh, logic behind new economics. Uh, and then, uh, well, we got carried away a bit. <laughs> We started out with <laughs> 10 essays, I, I believe. I mean, yes. 10, right? Yeah, something like we that. Ended yeah. up with 10 essays to just <laughs> give like a yeah. uh, broad, hybrid, <coughs> how do you say that, uh, hybrid or a broad perspective on the question what is economics? And now it's like a new, uh, it's like a comprehensive book actually with all these different essays. Well, but for it me, feels, it changed. Yeah. The, the, the question, I, I would answer it differently right now yeah. if you would ask, were to ask me what is economics. Yes. I would um, much sooner refer to, um, you know, a set of agreements that would um, balance the delicate, um, the delicate balance between human needs and the living world to restore, which is very different from what I've learned as a circular flow diagram. So there's. Uh, the consumers on this side and there's companies on the other side and some interaction happens and a lot of money needs to go around. Very different. So, yeah, so say it again because we, this is also, <laughs> yeah, so, so this is a Read delicate balance, no, <laughs> it's this one. So it's a delicate balance between human needs and the restoring of, of the living, living world, world. Of which we are completely dependent for our economic activity. For everything we do. For everything. But yes. we're talking about economics, so. Yes. You yeah. could also summarize it as applied ecology. Yeah. <laughs> if that helps you. Economy <laughs> is a a form, an applied form of ecology. In our humble opinion, it is, yes. Yes. Well, it's very interesting because uh, five years ago or something, I interviewed Louisa Fettier on stage, yes. of course. Uh, uh, the, the, the professor of ecology, she is now with uh, Emeritat. I yep. don't know, she's, she's, mm. she's, 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 well, I saw her, now she has an, an honorary doctorate again. But anyway, uh, she was saying, it's so fun, simple. We have three laws in ecology and these apply to Everything, Everything. Yes. in life. <laughs> why don't why, why don't they see that I am the professor of the heart of science? And, well, she didn't say it like that. I made no. it. I made her uh, agree with it. Uh, and uh, it was simple, huh? Everything, every energy, co all energy comes from the sun. Yep. Everything is circular, and for you need diversity to thrive. Yes. Uh, it was so simple. She basic said, why life. not? It's just the basic of ecology. But now I'm like, at the end of my career, I've noticed that these three principles are at the core yeah. of every discussion yeah. of vital organizations, of the economy, etc., yeah. etc. Yeah. So it's applied ecology. applied ecology. I don't think that all the students who have now entered uh, university or uh, and who have chosen <laughs> to study economy, that they are aware of the fact that they are actually uh, studying applied ecology. Well, I've, uh, what I find, uh, until now at least, is that lots of the students yeah. hunger for the new yeah. narrative. I think the lecturers yeah. are a bit of an issue. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, and, 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 and this book is hopefully going to help them to actually cross that bridge. Yes. Yes, that's at least what we uh, what we hope. Uh, well, but it's now, already but happening. That's the whole thing. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. already happening. There's a quite a lot of very concrete examples in exactly. this book. Yeah. So um, I meet a lot of students that have very intelligent, wicked questions uh, that a lot of our lecturers are yeah. not able to answer because their in their uh, interpretation of economics is way too narrow. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, and, and 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 again, you know, I, I'm I'm often joking about economists, as you know, but very serious meant what I what what we hope to achieve 
is that there is a much more intimate, intensive dialogue exactly. between the economists and the anthropologists, the ecologists, the social the sociologists out there, psychologists out there, uh, so that we can learn and broaden the scope of this wonderful uh, science. Yeah, beautiful. Yeah, it's, uh, it, people are, are already applauding. I mean, yeah, if you have that delicate balance definition in your in your head, you need every discipline actually to yes. contribute to research. What is a a correct, beautiful balance between these yeah. uh, these two? Yeah, beautiful. But we had to fight that out too. Yeah, yes. in the big in the beginning, you know, it's very easy to take a very activistic approach and want to change the system. But we decided to take a more of a healing approach. And uh, what's the difference between an activist approach well, and a healing approach? Well, we, I think we should allow what, what, what was, was, yeah. and then let it die respectfully. Oh, and yeah. <coughs> Okay, well, that's it's not, it's not only me that's saying that, of course. It's a, it's a, no, it's a systemic science of course. that, that uh, the capitalistic society in itself is losing relevancy, and yeah. that's why it's deteriorating. Yes. It's not because we're, we're fighting against it. It's deteriorating, so we're just... Um, it's dying from the inside we're out. Just, we're just looking at it and, and, and calling it out. Yes. And then saying, you know, but there's something else happening as well. Yeah. So this new world is emerging... But yeah. it's not emerging from an, from old thinking. It's emerging in itself, yeah. and that's the interesting bit, I think, from in this era. We found we found common ground uh, that helped us to 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 really find each other also in the narrative. In in Joanna Macy, who is one of the great thinkers, in, in, in we think, and uh, and she calls this this time the the great turning. And uh, and she 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 says we have to hospice the old and midwife the new. And, uh, and I think that's really... Uh, really Respectfully. Uh, yeah, well, yeah. And, and one can argue about what is respectful, but uh, <laughs> uh, it's, we need to do yeah. both. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I saw a video going in, uh, towards Glasgow. There were lots of interviews, and then somebody said, let's thank the fossil industry for creating all that, I mean, ending of suffering for lots of humans, but yeah. let's now say thank you for doing so, and let's... Uh, uh, well, let's not get confused with progress. That's yeah. not really necessary progress. progress. Yeah, I agree. It's something, uh, but it's not always progress. It's respectfully introducing the hospice. Yeah. Yeah, then, and where, <laughs> wherein then Shinta is more of the uh, thank you and I'm more the fuck you. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, both is ne necessary. And, I have uh, to be honest. Of, of course, this is a very celebratory day for the fossil free movement because, yes. of course, the big pension fund decided to stop in investing in fossil fuels. Yeah. Thank you, activists. Okay. Uh, I think that was their gift to us. So. Yes. Uh, thank you so much for this introduction to your beautiful new book. Congratulations. Thank you. Um, I'm now going to introduce some of the contributors yes. to the book. Yes. And at, after that interview, I will int get you back on stage because then we will have the official book launch to very special recipients of Derek. the first edition yes. of this book. Yes. Yes. Thank you so much for now. Yes. Thank you. Congratulations. <laughs> yes. So, we have, him, well, actually, Kees and, and Sinta, of course, have invited uh, some of the contributors to the book, and we're going to discuss what they actually think of being in this book, but also what the fundamental ideas are which are in the book, so you get a little bit of a tease, teaser, to actually start reading this 422-page thick book. Uh, let's let's start. Here in the, in Amsterdam are um, present Carolina Hummels. She's a professor of design and theory of for transformative quality at Eindhoven University of Technology. Welcome. <laughs> Great to have you here. Rolf Term, who is the founder and managing director of Ahead, Ahead, Ahead. Uh, welcome. <laughs> the chief investment strategist of Triodos uh, Bank, uh, Hans Stegeman. Welcome. Uh, I guess... Uh, he was the Hans uh, uh, case referred to when he said, okay, oh my God, this uh, person who has a doctorate in, econ in, in economics, he's probably going to have some critique on this vision. Uh, yeah, welcome. Be, uh, and we <laughs> are joined uh, via Zoom by two persons. Uh, uh, oh, Rutger. Oh, sorry, sorry, Rutger. 
Uh, okay, let, let, uh, oh, my, my notes, my notes, where are my notes? Uh, Rutger Hoekstra, welcome, okay, my notes are gone. Welcome, come, let's, let's introduce you to the stage. <laughs> oh, I got my notes confused because I put on stage one together. Welcome. And then the last person, last two persons I'm going to introduce are um, Catherine Terbach, who is a senior visiting research fellow at the University of Strathclyde, uh, Glasgow. Welcome, are you there? Yeah, oh, there, there. Uh, and last but uh, not, not least, uh, John Vollerton, who is an impact investor. Welcome uh, for joining us via Zoom. Okay. So we have this six contributors to this book. Have you read the entire book already? No. Nope. We're still waiting for I the official. I scanned everything. Uh, yeah. Yeah, you say, I didn't <laughs> have the first copy yet. No. Because somebody else will get that, yeah. Okay, so you are actually in a collection of very beautiful articles, but you, you, you don't actually already know in what you have actually ended up in. <laughs> Partly, only. Yes. Okay, We've so let's... We've seen a draft. You've seen a draft. Oh, you've seen a draft. And maybe you've seen the contributors. And you feel, yes. okay, this is a nice list to Breath actually taking. be part of, right? Okay, so let's start. Um, what is, I mean, why did you want to contribute to a book called The Fundamentals for a New Economy as a uh, title? For me, it's a really weird question because I have a background in design. Exactly. Uh, but what I notice is that designers nowadays, we bump into all kinds of societal challenges. Yeah. Uh, and the thing is that uh, we, s I think we can contribute a bit in this discussion because we have a very hands-on approach and also with, uh, us focusing on transforming practices. We kind of do it on a level that you actually can make a difference and an impact. And we thought it's actually nice not only to talk about models and analysis, but really <laughs> help in this new world in a hands-on different approach. Because if you stick in the old world with the old methods and the old tools and the old disciplines, you might end up with an old answer. Yeah. So getting in more in a transdisciplinary approach maybe yeah. including designers, you might end up with new answers. Probably. But uh, that's still, uh, well, that's a very nice, beautiful answer, but I still don't really understand. Uh, uh, what, what, what do you do if you are a professor of design and theory for transformative quality? So we very much try to, we basically do four things. We try to envision what a world might be ah. and we make that experientiable. Yeah. So we're actually yeah. working already with quite a few industries, with quite a few organizations and really let them experience what that future might be and what these maybe these new economic views might be in the future. Interesting. Um, and then of course you are already doing what they are actually wanting to do, envisioning that new world and what kind of fundamentals that new world Absolutely. actually needs. Um, what, was your con what is the essence of your contribution to the book? So what we try to, so the title is uh, Economy as a Transforming Practice. Yes. So instead of, we have quite a few, I think, okay, since Chinta were already saying it, we have a quite a few clashes between different paradigms that are currently, and in order to kind of tackle them, we really try to say at the level of a, of, a, of a practice, how could we rethink actually how we live together and then making new tools for it and make it, making new methods for it. So for instance, we work with uh, the milk industry to rethink actually what could that be? If you rethink actually in the milk industry what, what we could do, we work together with Rex Waterstaat. And is that, for instance, the idea that milk will not come from the cow anymore? Is that an option? Well, that might. we also worked with uh, the alternatives for meat, but <laughs> for the milk industry it was, but instead of throwing it all in one big bucket and just see it as a commodity that's, that's pushed around yeah, the entire country. Yeah you actually think, what is actually the quality of milk? And why are we paying so little for something that's so beautiful? And why do we have to transport most of the milk? 
So it's really rethinking this entire system. Okay, so it's also, I mean, this book is also giving you, presenting you mythologies to actually start thinking or imagining that different economy. And of course, I mean, with your practice or your uh, uh, professors, uh, your knowledge, you can actually introduce that mythology because that, that's what you do all day. Uh, with your students. Hans Tegeman, you are, uh, 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 would you, would, are you still proud to call yourself an economist? Sure. Okay. Yeah. I, uh, yeah. Um, and uh, to answer the case, of course, um, <laughs> I, I think the tools of, uh, of economists, also the basic tools and, and, and the writing of, of, of old economists are very useful also in applying it to a new economy. Yeah. And what I did in, in this book is also using the old economic toolbox, applying it to circular economy, but doing it in such a way that you say that the way we do it normally, and what you see in the papers and what companies do, is not enough. And that's a more radical approach to circular economy, but I think it's still a very traditional economic approach. I can do nothing else. I'm limited in my uh, capabilities in there. That's okay. Every yeah, every so human I have being to accept it. Yeah. Yeah. No problem. <laughs> every human being has to has to accept his limitations yeah. every day. And that's that's why it's great to be in this book because yeah. there are a lot of other people who can yeah. contribute from different sides and, and have different insights. What's the most what what's the essence of your contribution to the book? Um, the essence I think is a few rules in the economy are not in line with a circular economy, and that's, yeah. that's, that's really in line with ecology. Uh, for instance, uh, private ownership, which is a cornerstone of markets, because we need to have transactions, and what we do with transactions... You have to own something to give it away yeah. or to sell it and or whatever. And it's very efficient, because we don't want to know what you do with what you, what you buy from me. We, we don't want to control it, so we, we get ri uh, rid of a lot of risks. But if you want to have a circular economy, you want to have the opposite. You want to have... Uh, that, that people who produce something, that they also own it and that they take care of it and that they take it back. It's a very fundamental problem or a fundamental difference, if you want to say, if you want to create a circular economy. You, yeah. have, you have to really look into how markets work. Yeah, but we also have to, so we also have to reimagine the governance or yeah. the ownerships issues yeah. in the economy. And, and, and so that is one example of where, in which that circular economy is not, uh, or the economy as we have well, created it now, and the institutions which are operating in it are actually not in line with the philosophy or the essence of the of the circular economy. And you say we have to we have to radically rethink that aspect. As, uh, I have seven of these. Seven, things, yes. But that's too much because other people also <laughs> want to talk. But you can read the book, of course. Yes, they have to um, now. It's a no, big good teaser. Yeah. Yeah, but but it's it's one example, it's and, one example. and and this is really necessary if you read all the all the. There, there's a lot of companies, I don't want to, yeah, there's a lot of bullshit about circular economy and companies say, yeah, we're becoming circular like IKEA or H&M or whatever. What they do is completely against the idea of circular economy. Why? Because what they do is fast fashion, fast furniture, selling as much as possible, as, as soon as possible, letting it go um, stuck or whatever as soon as possible. Well, it's designed to break or absolutely. to deteriorate. And you want to create the opposite. So if you see those companies and you buy something from H&M and they say, please take, a, you can bring your clothes back if you don't want to have it. It's, 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 nah, it leads to nothing. And that's what we have to change. So that's a little bit radical. So seven notions which are now currently institutionalized in the economy as we know it, which have to radically be transformed to actually reach that circular economy. Let's go to Catherine Trebak, um, Senior Visiting Research Fellow, and also, I mean, lead for the Wellbeing Economy Alliance. And I was triggered by the description I got for you because you have ideas for a grown-up economy and I was like, oh, yes, that's, that's good. We are now in a childish economy. We're, we're in an economy that really hasn't recognized that in a sense it's arrived. And so that's the essence of the chapter that Jeremy Williams and I contributed. Yes. It is time to ask this question that in the past has been heretical and almost forbidden that the project of economic growth, does it actually have a destination? And as development, as we traditionally understand it, as incremental increases in GDP, 
has is that a recipe of the 20th century and so the the second part of the idea of arrival is can we actually now allow ourselves to make ourselves at home in this economy <laughs> in the sense that we've we've got enough and that's a very very different project from one that is faster faster economic growth more and more things exploit extract this is an economy that's all about making sure everyone has enough with what we've got. And so that's a very challenging conversation for some people around sharing better, essentially. And it's about, as Hans has just been saying, making better use of cherishing the resources we've got rather than just extracting them, using them and throwing them away. So it's a, it's a very different perspective on the economy. Yeah, it's, 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 it's actually what Sinta said, of course. I mean, in when I said, what's the essence? She said, well, in, in this idea of the fundamentals of a new economy, life is at the center, not yeah. models. I wrote that down because it's such a, such a beautiful encapsulation of the shift in mindset we need to embrace as societies. And I think that's why Case and Shint have done such a beautiful job. And I want to thank them and congratulate them because what they've created is a essentially a handbook of ideas that societies need to grapple with if our, if our species, if humanity, if our future is going to be hopeful, if it's going to be safe, it's, if it's going to be just, if it's going to be fun. And, and I think this book is a really vital contribution of that. In, in the past, I mean, it was back in 1983 when Ronald Reagan said, there are no limits to growth because there are no limits to our imagination. And in recent years, I've been thinking it's our limited imaginations that have stopped us thinking of an economy that is better than growth. And what this book really does is said, you know what? Lack of ideas is no excuse anymore. There are plenty of ideas and imaginings out there what we now need to do is roll up our sleeves and start delivering them and implementing them. Yes. Yeah, it's beautiful. <laughs> so um, um, Hans Tegeman was saying in my book in that in his uh, contribution, he was actually exploring these seven aspects of the current economy, which are uh, um, uh, not aligned uh, with a circular economy. If you say we have to actually, there are enough ideas now, and this book shows a a beautiful uh, collection of that diversity in thinking, in alternative thinking. Uh, what would be the first step, according to you, to actually realize in that envisioned new future? Well, I think one of the tasks is for us to recognize that this is not a simple flick of a light switch. There is a plethora of changes that are going to be required, whether it's how we understand the purpose of the economy, how we design businesses, how we utilize tax instruments, how we design our cities, how we design products. So there is essentially a place for everyone in this journey. So it's not one simple act. And unfortunately, it would be a lot easier if it was. This, this is why we need a rich, diverse, creative exactly. movement around this. But I, I like to think of what I describe as the four Ps. I'm afraid it's not in my, my chapter in the book. But in a way, these are the corners of that jigsaw puzzle of different pieces we need to put in place. And one is about purpose. How do we purpose the economy? Is it just faster GDP growth? Or is it about collective human and ecological well-being? Is it about prevention? Are we getting things right first time round or constantly putting sticking plasters on the damage that our economic system's done? The third P is about pre-distribution, which is a bit of a clunky idea, but it's essentially about getting the economy to do more of the heavy lifting in delivering social justice and sustainability. So rather than relying on government to fix up, saying, well, how do we design the economy? So it's not necessarily about spending, it's design. And then the final one is that it has to be people powered. How do we put people and communities at the forefront of these conversations, help them design the economic systems we need rather than just having these decisions taken in some remote boardroom that doesn't really give, a, I was about to be very Glaswegian on you there, doesn't really give a monkeys about the outcomes for citizens on the planet. Uh, this is Amsterdam. You're completely allowed to use that language. Don't worry. Uh, Rutger um, uh, Hoekstra, Associate Professor in Leiden um, on environmental input output modeling and beyond GDP. Yes. <laughs> uh, actually, so we have to imagine beyond growth, but you're saying we also have to imagine beyond profits or even beyond GDP, right? Y yes, and, and 
I guess uh, that my book chapter and also my book is very much uh, born out of a, a frustration. Yeah. If you have a room full of economists and you ask them, how do you measure the economy? Everybody in unison will say GDP. And in our community, for the last 50 years, we have been discussing how to go beyond GDP. And there are literally hundreds of indicator systems uh, out there. And so, perhaps also nice for the discussion, but broadening sometimes also has a negative uh, impact. And I, I'm really kind of uh, at the moment where I think I've studied these things for, for forever. I've looked at psychology, I've looked at uh, natural sciences. There's a huge hundreds of people that have thought of this issue. There's so much knowledge, Nobel Prize winners, such brilliant people. Isn't it about time that we actually started to coalesce or uh, consolidate some of the knowledge that we have rather than broadening all the time that there can be a negative aspect to it so all my research and advocacy is actually based on uh, understanding what we have what is brilliant about it what is not so good about it and how might we actually uh, create some commonality in this space and one of the reasons I say this is that uh, I also do a lot of uh, research on media and I, it's probably no surprise, but if you look at the archives of the New York Times, you can actually do a 100-year analysis of the rise of economic thinking. And you can also do research into our top uh, indicators that we've proposed in the last 50 years. So the Human Development Index, or SDGs, they are mentioned less than 100 times in the New York Times, a left-leaning uh, uh, thing. So. I'm kind of at the stage, and maybe that's also nice for the discussion, I think broadening is great, but at some stage we also have to see each other as a community and also coalesce around certain ideas, and I don't think we would ever want one index. So uh, just to be very clear, we do not as a community want one index, but we want uh, a consolidation that when a journalist asks us, what, uh, you are so critical of GDP, What's, uh, so what do you propose? And then basically our answer is, is it's complicated. <laughs> <laughs> and so your, and you, so your article is actually uh, uh, trying to get, I mean, um, uh, convince us, the community or the us, the readers, the world of the, 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 the critical world of, of, of neoclassical thinking needs also some coordination. I'm actually, in my book, very complementary of the organizational capacity of economists. Having this yeah. whole room know what that GDP is the indicator for. It's amazing. It's amazing. What yeah. they have done in 60, 70 years is just f actually, you can criticize the content <laughs> of what they've done, but the organization capability is huge. And they didn't just create an ind index, they created a system of national accounts, they created models. We might disagree with what those models are telling us, but their er organizational capacities are huge. So, and, and, and what, are the, what is the main lesson for that? What, what is the driver of that organi organizational power? That, have you find that, found that out? Because if well, you know that, we can actually... Well, well the, the, the thing is that actually after the war, the UN and OECD basically forced the economists to... So in the yeah. 1930s, they were not organized. And so in the 1940s and 50s... So it's convincing the, the, the global institutions to actually... Well, I, d I don't know whether we would want to leave it to the global institutions no. because we don't know whether it will be multidisciplinary enough. Yeah. But at the same time, I do not see any coordinating mechanism. Everybody has a different answer to what is beyond GDP, and I think that's actually very detrimental for well, us. We ha and and, and you, you mentioned the SDGs, which have uh, so uh, only been mentioned in the New York Times for 100 times. They have 17 goals, 100 and yeah. 69 uh, indicators. Uh, what happened? <laughs> yep. <laughs> it's complex. Not yeah, but much. you can go around. Uh, so okay. I don't want. Uh, so every yeah. every system has some benefits. It yeah, but you benefits. say let's go around the table and try to f to, to to actually come up with some measurements well, we which actually impact. answer, yeah. We need impact okay. beyond this room. And let's be inspired. In this, in yeah. this room, okay. we probably all agree GDP is bad, we're going in the wrong direction, but we all have different answers Clear. to this question. Um, and so I would really, uh, I, I want some kind of mechanism but whereby mm -hmm. we actually start collaborating in a very multidisciplinary way. Um, on this topic. Let's, let's go to, to Ralph Thurm. Um, you are actually um, uh, supporting 
co companies uh, to actually create, well, become more sustainable or become really sustainable? I, I, I yeah. Um, yes. <laughs> yes. Ahead, <laughs> ahead. A beautiful well, title for a. Yeah, thank you very position. much. And I'm also the managing director of an organization called R3.0, which stands for Redesign for Resilience and Regeneration. Beautiful. Yeah. Which um, is a not for profit organization. Therefore, I hesitated to say. Bluntly, yes. Oh, yeah, a, because you also, yeah, yeah we're you are a slasher. Also, yeah, well, yeah. We're, we're looking at a whole community yeah. and we're trying to really um, hospicing the old and midwifing the new. Yeah. Um, as has been said a couple Beautiful. of times. Yeah. I think um, in our contribution, um, what we did is that we thought about the question, when are we actually successful yeah. in sustainability and in regeneration? through the use of economic instruments as well. And by that, we also go back to the or origins of sustainability and just rethink what a comic version we made out of it in the last 20 years. We've actually reduced it to a comic version of the original concept. And I, very often when I'm, when I'm asking people uh, in, uh, uh, in discussions, I ask them, how many of you have actually read the Brundtland report from 1987, which is, the Bible of Sustainable Development. May I ask everyone here? <laughs> see how little, how little fingers yeah. go up? Yeah. Um, and we just also need to realize when we are doing this, we need to go back to the roots of what was once plan, plan, uh, people, planet, and prosperity yeah. with the human being in the center or at the center, and we made people, planet, and profit out of it. Yeah. So that's already one deficiency. The other, and that's really the core of sustainability is what is called intergenerational equity. This famous sentence from the Brundtland report that says, in your generation, do anything that would harm further generations to have the same opportunities than your own generation. Ask anybody in any company nowadays, what do you do for intergenerational equity? <laughs> they have no idea what you're talking about. So when we are redesigning an economic system that should create what we call system value, we also need to rethink and go back to the roots of sustainability. And that's what we try to combine in, in our contribution. And I have to say, I wrote that together with our senior director, Bill Bowie, who is also on the live stream. Hello, Bill. Um, <laughs> and try to establish that what is absolutely, uh, what is actually necessary, mm. not what is politically opportune or practically no. possible. What is this necessary. What is necessary and do that in a way that we're not competing with anybody. So at R3.0, we don't know the word competition. It doesn't exist. It has caused a lot of harm for the sake of profits. But we need to go back to something more collaborative and there, there are so many different priorities that we need to set in a regenerative and distributive economy and that's what we are aiming at in our contribution and just develop that and uh, recommend a couple of tools. So maybe I just want, yeah. to, want to mention one. There's actually, there's a lot happening around what is called true costing. So the internalization of external effects into cost accounting. We do that for 20 years. The whole discussion about internalizing external effects into cost accounting is a discussion that's 40 years old. Of course. And what has happened? Well, little, little. close to nothing. And, um, from that perspective, we were analyzing, okay, what is necessary, again, necessary, for a market mechanism to actually help us thrive? And the outcome is, and we always think in systemic terms, you need true costing, yes, of course, but you also need true benefiting. You need to know the positive contributions. You need true pricing. Those two first things need to translate into price mechanisms, and you need true taxation and true remuneration or compensation. But and it's only the combination of those five things that will make a market mechanism um, work in a way that the more sustainable product becomes cheaper and less sustainable product uh, becomes more expensive. 
that we're doing patchwork all the time. We're just not doing things systemically. Yeah. That's what we try to explain. I see that everybody wants to, to, to get into the discussion, but of course this is a presentation of a book where all these ideas are complementary next to each other. That's why I try to create a narrative, which actually works. <laughs> so far, so good. Let's, let's go to the fifth contributor, John uh, uh, Fullerton, the impact investor, uh, reg uh, also regenerative capitalism, how universal patents and principles will shape the new economy. Hopefully, this also adds to the, to, to the conversation we now have in actually what are we talking about if we talk about fundamentals for a new economy? Yeah. Oh, oh. You muted. You have to unmute yourself. There we go. Are you? Yeah. Sorry about Perfect. That. Uh, hello, everyone. Nice to be with you. Um, so, uh, for me, I really go back to what um, uh, Keith and Shinta, where they started us, and that is to uh, understand that economics is a is a um, is is applied ecology, and that is very different than the neoclassical paradigm. And and there are many un, unquestioned assumptions that go into the neoclassical paradigm that because we're trapped in it, we can't see. So, for example. Um, just the idea of the pursuit of efficiency is trapped, is being trapped in the neoclassical uh, paradigm. And it turns out that living systems uh, balance efficiency and resiliency. So the principle, my passion for principles is balance. And there are many other things that need to be in balance. But that tells us that our unquestioned pursuit of efficiency has actually led to many of the problems we're facing. And that's just one example. So, so my kind of core um, work and, and, and you know, beginning with the launch of, of my um, uh, regenerative economics paper in 2015 is to take the notion seriously that economics, the science of economics is really a subset of the science of ecology and that there isn't an independent science of economics. Yes. Oh, yeah. In the, in the, I'm trying to like, what are you actually? Yes. <laughs> uh, um, nice that you actually bring the discussion back to, to, to because in, in your contributions, the notion of that we are actually talking about applied ecology. Uh, we were talking about indicators, which are like all over the place. And of course, interestingly enough, I mean, the idea of what is the essence of sustainability, which is actually also in the Brundtland report. I mean, you could, I think she would agree with the idea that economy is applied ecology. Absolutely. Uh, and also, of course, the circular economy is really in, in, in the interpretation of an ecological vision of the economy. So we try to a little bit, I mean, try to find what happens if you look through that lens uh, uh, to, to economy. Um, yeah, and what happens then? So you now know a little bit of what's in the book from the other contributors. That's nice. <coughs> <laughs> <coughs> Got tested, don't worry. Um, uh, the, so so why, is it, why, why is it important that all these different perspectives are actually collected in a volume? What, why is that important? Would like well, I can start because it, it Re reflects how we work at R3.0 as well. You know, when you look at the question of climate change and everything that we know for decades, and still we haven't solved it. And there are certain tools that are thrown to it from, from governments, from ministries, from uh, certain NGOs, and still they are dualistic. You know, this is bad, this, this is good. There's always a need for a third way. And in our work, what we explored was that you need to bring various disciplines together. But the way how we did it is, is that we first thought about what's an ideal, and then backcast it from that ideal and looked at all the different um, areas that need to simultaneously leapfrog towards that target. Mm. So you think about what data do you need? Mm. What sort of accounting do you need for that? What sort of business model design do you need for that? What sort of transparency do you need for that? What sort of finance do you need for that? And in order to let, to bring people to the table and let them follow suite what education is needed for that and what sort of governance is needed for that. So that idea of a simultaneous leapfrog of the many disciplines or the many different areas are just inherent to our work. Therefore, it was logic that we would contribute to that reader. 
Yeah, that you would contribute, I can imagine. But why is it necessary to have like all these different contributions in 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 this volume? I mean, what? Why is it important? Because it was, of course, meant to be a reader, just with some different like ideas to get like the, the, the next to all these classical economic books for studying. You could say, okay, read this. There is an alternative world out there. You should educate yourself on that. And now it's, it's like 422 pages thick book and you are all part of it. Why is it, was it important that the book I, if, if students read this, I think first they will be confused on a higher level, um, <laughs> because it's really different. I think what's, what what the contributions are, and hopefully, if they start thinking, they see well. First, what is economy? Is it applied ecology, or is it applied sociology, or is it applied psychology? And I think it, the conclusion should be it's all relevant. Mm. Um, and then it would help if you have all those different ideas and, and you've read everything that you can apply it to a concept. What, yeah. what problem do you want to solve? Yeah. Because only if, is it a new indicator or is it whatever, only then it makes sense. Yeah. And so for me, the book is, is getting ideas, uh, different ideas, because economics is nothing else than a story and a set of rules that we can use. Yes. But it's we need to apply it. Yeah, and then so from whatever problem or issue you're dealing with you can use this as a like a backlog a or a i would say i don't know the english words case humuslaag um uh, uh <laughs> <Bedrock. laughs> humus the back rock? Bedrock? Yeah, I mean, so with all these fertilization in, in the ground, yeah, okay. Humuslaag of thinking. I mean, it's all there and you can grow your own project and ideas on that. That's that's an understory is uh, Sinta is, is is actually telling me now what to say. Yeah, an understory for your own story. Uh, beautiful. Um, and um, are you gonna are you gonna uh, let your students read it? You know, it's not good uh, if there's only <laughs> one university. I, I think I would. Um, it, uh, what I appreciate it about the book is the multidisciplinarity. I think that's really, we've had kind of a monoculture, um, a very dominant strain of economic thinking. Yeah. I do think sometimes there's a bit of a straw man argument. Uh, there are many brilliant economists like Danny Roderick that can explain you know, where e economics, for example, has gone into behavioral economics. And Love the trilemma. Okay, yes, as exactly. A matter. <laughs> okay. So uh, the... Uh, <laughs> There's loads of there's loads of actually even multidisciplinary economists and yeah. and what I like about this book is that it gives a vision of of uh, authors I think that we are very uh, sometimes unfamiliar with or perhaps within certain groups we are domains yes. yes we should be more connected yes this book creates yeah. that connection yeah, yeah. so um, I, yeah I would definitely for inspiration you there are definitely chapters that you would read I don't know whether you would necessarily read all 442 but uh, there are definitely chapters that uh, I think are very valuable Catherine is there in the English language already a book which actually tries to be a, a syllabus a underread a, a understory for creating your own story of uh, a new fundamental or new economic thinking there's collections of books yes but not i don't think in such a powerful and diverse and accessible way but but um john from the sort of north america perspective you might have thoughts too of, of, of how this adds value yeah john uh well no i mean you know to be honest the uh the the work uh, coming out of North America is probably the least developed of the alternative <laughs> economic thinking. We're, we're, we're pretty well uh, well entrenched with our neoliberalism over here. Um, so oh, that's why I'm I happy see. to have a, a shot at getting a slice in a book that's, uh, that's coming out in Europe. <laughs> Great to help an American today. Uh, yeah. well, but but, but I, I will add, I, I, so my, my particular chapter, I, I take the this premise of, of, uh, of, of ecological principles and patterns as a starting point and, and address um, uh, what that implies for our financial system. And I, and I do believe that our financial system is the root cause of, of many of our challenges. So uh, hopefully that makes a good contribution. Yeah, now everybody in the room sees that I'm like 
looking at technician because I don't know whether we have six, six minutes until nine or six minutes till the end of the conversation because there's six minutes left. Until we end. Okay, yeah. So, I, thought you, I thought you were clicking at your watch to tell me to stop talking. No, no, no. <laughs> I was looking because I want, of course, to, to see the live cast uh, people, the official moment of the, the book. And that's why we're going to, well, we're only going to like um, pause this conversation uh, because we're going to do for the live cast the, the, the official book launch and the presentation of the first uh, 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 copy. Uh, and then after that, we're going to say goodbye to the people from the live cast. The Zoom speakers will be still in our conversation. You will be on stage, the authors, the editors will be on stage, and we'll have a jam session with the audience. So, 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 so let's keep it, let's, let, let's stop here, pause here for a moment and have the official ce celebration, and then we'll continue the conversation. But give them a big thank you already for inducing this. Yeah, that's why I always want a live clock with the time on it. Uh, let's go and have uh, get them back on stage. Uh, the, yours, the editors of this book, Sinta Osterwald, Kees Klom. Yes, your shoe. Oh, this beautiful shoe, yeah. Shoe drops or something. Sinta. Okay, so, Sinta and Case, you have decided to give the first copies of the book to very special people. I love this idea. But first, try not to say who they are, but explain why you wanted these persons to get the first copies. I think that we wrote it down in the dedication already that we didn't want to mend a broken economy. It's not for us to say, but we want to um, move from an integrity. And I think that's what the essay is. That, that, that's explained. what binds them. Yeah, it's beautiful. So where to find the integrity of our own lives other than with the people we are now presenting the first copies to. Exactly. Would you like to add? Well, the whole book has been a process, uh, uh, as we call it, a labor of love. Yes. And uh, the persons that we are going to invite on stage are the epitome of love. Of the labor of love. Also the labor of love. Yes. <laughs> I thought you would I, say I, that. I, I wanted to really keep it uh, the, the tidy here. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Let 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 us let call them out on stage, please. Yep. You call With the names, please. The names. Eva and Ivy, my daughters. And my oldest daughter, Philippa. Woo! Give them a big applause. Gaan jullie maar even naast de, ja, staan naast de auteurs. Ik hoor hier, ja, ja. Het is voor het plaatje, ik hoef daar helemaal niet bij. Ja, het boek. Drie boeken. Daar gaan we. De eerste, oh, the first copies, sorry. The first copies of this book will be going to these. Beautiful. How much fast. Yeah, and and then I'm gonna ask you just, heb je iets begrepen van wat er net werd gezegd? Nee, hè? Vond je het wel? Heeft je moeder heel hard gewerkt aan dit boek? Ja. Yeah. Her mother worked quite hard on this book. Heb je dat een beetje gemist toen in die tijd, of ging het wel goed in de combinatie van thuis zijn en dat boek maken? Ja, het ging wel goed. Hoe heet, goed. Hoe heet je knuffel? Flappy. En 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 um, als je nadenkt hè, over de wereld zoals we die nu kennen. Wat vind je dan het allerbelangrijkste dat al deze mensen die hier in deze zaal zitten zouden moeten weten? Als je tien bent en je denkt na over de wereld. Ik weet het niet. Nee. Oké, okay, heel goed. Goed antwoord. Goed antwoord. En um, uh, als, je, als, je, als jullie nadenken over um, hoe belangrijk het nadenken over is over een eerlijke wereld. En een wereld waar klimaatverandering niet komt. Denk je daar, denk je daar wel eens over na? Nee. Oh, wat goed. Nou goed, top. En dat, dat is heel een goed antwoord. Um, hebben jullie jullie vader gemist? Uh, altijd. Ja. Hey, en uh, wat is het belangrijkste idee wat je vader je tot nu toe heeft geleerd over het leven? 
Uh, oe. <laughs> dat is echt een hele moeilijke vraag. Maar, je weet het antwoord niet. Ja, gewoon dat alles moet beter. <laughs> ja. Alles moet beter? Ik uh, wil ten eerste even zeggen dat ik ontzettend trots ben op mijn vader. Ja. Uh, hij wil echt een goede, mooie wereld voor ons achterlaten. En uh, daar ben ik heel erg trots op. Ja. Nou, geef ze een groot applaus. Er is champagne uitgedeeld om dit te vieren. En uh, om deze livecast, uh, to end this livecast, I did it in Dutch because I thought it would be more comfortable. Um, to end this livecast, um, Kees, you have decided to actually use music for that, and very specific music. What are we going to listen to? Uh, well, last uh, Saturday I went to see a concert of uh, Nienke Laverman, uh, and she has made a epic album planned and she played one uh, this song she played and uh, it made me cry uh, and I think there is n the w although it is in Frisch <laughs> uh, so That's just a yes but it's 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 the language of the heart so I would invite everybody to close their eyes and really listen to these words and then we go back to the program Night Night is seen Volg je de flinten 